I'm Shane White, and this is The Process. Hey gang, Shane White here with another edition of The Process. Today I'm going to be illustrating a second variant cover for my friend Jeremy Hahn's book, The Realm. And like the first variant, I'm continuing to experiment with this technique that I'm developing for my next graphic novel that I'm hoping will come out next year. It just depends on how fast I can get through this. It's a um, laborious process, but I think what I've learned after doing the first one was that the amount of stress <laughs> involved in working on this uh, nice expensive Stonehenge paper does not really play well with uh, my sensibilities. So I think what I I may end up doing is relegating this nice paper to sketchbooks or specifically just one-off illustrations. If you make a mistake on this, you can't white it out. You have to fix it in post, and that's not something I, I wanted to do. I wanted to keep things moving fast and free and easy, and this technique is very involved, and it's got a lot of brushwork in the sense that it's classical in, the, in like the early 20th century kind of classical ink work where there's more shading and in turning of form. And so I think what I'm going to do is relegate this to a rough bristol as opposed to this nicer paper. So I've got some of that in stock and I'm going to do some testing here, hopefully in the next couple of months. Stay tuned for that. That, That's going to be a lot of fun trying to get the same look with that paper. Like always, I'm using Speedball Super Black Ink, and I'm also using a Raphael Number no. 2 8404 brush. It's um, it's starting to come around for me. I haven't used it much in the past. And the more you use a brush, sometimes the more you start to learn its characteristics and start to work with it better. For me, I think in the beginning, this brush had initial fat body with a, a short tip. So when I'd go to pull a, some feathering, it always always end quickly. It didn't have a, a long feathering. So I, again, you, you, you'll have to find out that characteristic of, of the brush to really be able to use it to your benefit. But it takes some practice. Uh, that's why I think uh, in an earlier video, I suggested never use a new brush on a project. You really have to break it in and sort of connect with it. One of the things I wanted to do with this technique on this variant cover specifically was to create a sense of depth. Now, you can create depth in a couple different ways. In some ways, you can use thin lines for things that are far away and use thicker lines for things that are close up. You can simplify blacks, you can simplify shapes for things far away, and then you can add more feathering and more detail for things close up. And in this specific cover, I'm trying something a little bit in between that. I'm using thinner lines and just as much brushwork and shading in the background as I am in the foreground, but I'm using more spotted blacks in the foreground. So you'll see as this video goes on that there's gonna be a sense of depth that's only gonna be enhanced by the coloring. And another way to get a sense of painterly look or atmosphere and depth is Uh, losing edges. Not everything has to have an outline. I tend to outline figures in the foreground and depending on where things are in terms of light and atmosphere, I may or may not lose an edge. I may not connect all the lines. I may leave something open. And that adds another layer of depth and and sort of integrity to, to the work.
another thing, the object of this style is I wanted to rely heavily on the ink work because it was one of those things when I was learning how to ink or fell in love with ink in general, it was because I was looking at a lot of stuff from the early 20th century. Joseph Clement Cole, James Montgomery Flagg, Arthur Ignatius Keller, and I mean, those are there's a lot of them, but those are some of the heavy hitters that I remember early on when I was learning. Also with this technique, I wanted to find a way to color less. I wanted the color to be less intrusive and use it only to really push things in moments where the color was super, super important. I want the line work to be the hero. I want you to get lost in the details and the atmosphere. I want it to feel like it was painted with ink and brush. In this area specifically where I'm illustrating the side of a stone pillar, I want to have these opportunities, these moments where you create sort of this culture or mythos in the art that is carved into these rock places. And so what that does is it helps... It helps give a sense of time and place, and it suggests a depth of the world in which you're illustrating. Remember, every aspect of an illustration should tell a story. It should serve the greater purpose, whether it's the focal point of the illustration or the focal point of the story that you're trying to convey in this one moment in time. Unlike comic books where you can hide in you know, the multitude of panels, this is really important because people are lingering on the cover. They are looking at the cover as a point of purchase, and that's super important when you're trying to get someone to separate themselves from their money. Now you can see here some of the heavier black that I'm using. I'm doing heavier brushwork. It weights the bottom of the illustration and creates depth where the creature in the background is lighter and thinner in line work.
Unlike previous videos, this will be the first one that I'm showing you the actual coloring process, which I don't normally do because I, up until this point I haven't had the software to capture anything from Photoshop. So here I'm, I'm taking the opportunity to show you just a little bit of what goes into flatting and piecing together the illustration. Now this illustration in particular, I overcolored. I hadn't planned on putting this much effort into the coloring, but I did to see how far can I push it before I start losing the line work. And that was kind of the, the idea. I wanted to see what the upper limits were for coloring before it suddenly was out of balance. And I think I got close to that edge, but if on my new project, if I were to color this even more, I would, I would certainly have wasted a lot of time in the ink work. So essentially what I'm working on here is I'm going to lay out my flats, lay out the color balance, and then just go in with a simple uh, shadow and some highlights and, and keep it really high level. I don't want to over render anything. I think you'll start losing things. And in fact, when you look at some of the older comics of the day, it's flatter color and people, you know, I think reveled at the idea of, of seeing the line work. Especially in the larger magazines of the 70s, you'll see stuff like Vampirilla or Eerie Magazine where you can really get up close to that artwork. And while those were gray washes and, and so forth, I still think we've lost a lot in the sense that comics have changed in a way where we don't use as much feathering and we rely a lot more on color. While that's a good thing in some ways, you also have to know how to adapt and adjust for that. A lot of inking today tends to rely on the colorist to do the heavy lifting, and so you don't see as many blacks spotted. You see very little feathering. If there are, is some feathering, it's kept to a, a small degree. Uh, you got guys like Nick Bradshaw, Art Adams, uh, and then you know a few others, and even some of the classic guys like Lee Weeks still do some feathering, but they, they do try to keep it to a minimum. If you were to look at comics from the Bronze Age, that feathering is really bold. It's in your face. It's just... And I think it had a lot to do with the influx of Filipino artists coming in, like uh, Rudy Nebrez, Armando Gil, and, oh, Alex Nino, super, super artist. So if you look at those guys, you'll kind of get a sense of when they came around and how artists adapted to that and changed in the, in the Bronze Age of comics during the 70s and early 80s. When coloring, one of the things to keep in mind, just like when you're inking, is where is your source of light? As you might have seen in the beginning, I had a grayscale rough of what I was going to work on. That grayscale also included how my lighting scheme was going to work. And it's good to, to do that, to kind of give you a reminder of where things are headed. That way you can serve where that light is coming from. In most cases, illustrating a creature scene at night makes it easier to sell the idea of horror and fear. For me, I wanted something a little different. I grew up watching Godzilla and a lot of these monster movies, and I thought, why not try something during the daytime? You get that atmospheric effect, and it also helps give you a sense of scale, which I think was kind of the impetus for trying this. I thought maybe if I can see depth and get that scale that you can invoke a sense of fear in what these uh, heroes are facing up against. Well, that seems to be all for today. I hope you enjoyed watching this, and hey, if you really enjoy this channel, please tell your friends, subscribe, and if you would like, leave some comments below on things you'd like to see in the future or uh, questions you might have. I'm pretty active in answering them, so I usually get back to you within a week or less, and yeah, I'm always interested to uh, hear feedback. So, as always, thanks for watching.